and I'm a Rimmer, and we're Squirrel Nation. So I studied the brain, and Caroline studied visual arts, as you heard, and we've been merging that ever since. Uh, Caroline works at BBC as well as a designer. I'm a teacher at uh, University of Salford. Uh, but now we're going to talk about the stuff we do as Squirrel Nation, and we create experiences. Um, today, we hope to demonstrate the power of observation to help us reimagine our relationship with the natural world. To get you closer to this idea, um, watch this video and follow the instructions. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? who spotted the moon walking bear the first time around. Can't see everyone, but it, it looks like it's roughly um, a third of you. So what, what's happening here? This is an experiment designed by Simon and Chabry in the 90s at Harvard University. And the original experiment actually involved a gorilla that thumps its chest. Uh, they found that 50% of people who watched the video missed the gorilla. It was as if the gorilla didn't exist. So what's going on here? Well, two things. We miss a lot of what goes on around us, and actually we have no idea of what we're missing. Um, to get closer to this idea, I was interested in how plants sense environments. They can, for example, uh, detect changes in different wavelengths of red light. Red light um, sensed at dawn when the sun rises, and it's far red light that's sensed as, at dusk when the sun sets. Um, this creates a switch that lets the plant sense uh, the length of night. This means that plants know when it's summertime because the nights get shorter. Um, this has been manipulated by flower growers to provide flowers out of season. Now, we made a film called Nature Switch uh, to try and detect the switch by situating ourselves in a range of settings and filming the environments at dusk and dawn. We observed a plant laboratory, our allotment, a field, two cities and an industrial greenhouse. We tried to make the invisible visible and ended up questioning what is natural and what is man-made. So this film that we made, Nature Switch, it was screened originally in a, a gallery in London and then it was exhibited outside in the wilderness of an overgrown cemetery at a festival in the east end of London. We were lucky enough to sit in a field as the sun went down and the film was screened. And it was an amazing moment for us uh, because the film was reconnected to that natural switch that inspired it. In our lifetime, humans have become the equivalent of asteroid-designed dinosaurs. But here, now, here's a scary thought. If we can imagine life on Earth without humans, could this help us imagine an alternative future that we can become part of? So according to astronomer Martin Rees, if the 21st century were put into the wider context of the universe, which we imagine started in January and ended in December, the 20th century would only be around for a quarter of a second in June. And yet, we've had a massive impact. So, how did you imagine a life beyond yourselves? I asked a few people, where I teach at Salford University, how they might imagine that scenario. And they suggested looking to science fiction movies like I Am Legend and Silent Running, or places where civilization has collapsed, or to imagine the world from the perspective of another species. I suggested introducing a super predator. I was thinking of aliens. And a conservationist said, Rob Young, said to me, we've already introduced super predators, Arima, with our overuse of antibiotics. So are we sleepwalking into creating a future for human, but without humans? So thinking from that perspective of a world without us, without humans, could this help us to be more conscious of the future we're creating? Uh, back in 2015, we got our hands dirty. 
We started farming organic vegetables in the countryside just outside Manchester. We loved open lands landscapes and long horizons and getting away from our computer screens and cityscapes. We loved the feeling of working hard physically and caring long term for the soil and the crops. We realised, though, that very few rest city residents can experience this. We decided to tackle this by bringing a pop-up container farm from the countryside into the city centre in Manchester. And we called this Farm Lab. It was a bit of an experiment. And our first crop is oyster mushrooms. Why mushrooms, you might think. So edible mushrooms, uh, like oyster mushrooms, are fungi. So this is a whole other species. Uh, and fungi are nature's great recyclers. And their mycelium, the cells that live uh, as an underground network, can digest organic materials like wood, straw, and coffee grounds, turning them into food that's rich in protein. So how could thinking from the perspective of the oyster mushroom open up new connections to the natural world? And we were inspired by this guy, Paul Stamets. So we set up this pop-up farm, and we had a coffee trike next to the, to the, to the farm. And we'd, people would drink a coffee, we'd collect the waste coffee grounds from the coffee trike, and then people would take some of the mycelium and in, put that into 500 grams of coffee waste in a bag, and people would take that home, put it into a dark cupboard, and six to eight years, eight, eight years, no, <laughs> six to eight weeks later, um, it would be taken out with a bit of light of water, which mimics autumn, and this would turn into 50 grams of edible mushrooms that you could then have for breakfast. So the whole journey from waste coffee grounds to growing mushrooms to cooking and eating mushrooms is made visible, all within the space of a few, few miles, or even a few metres with our pop-up. And the contents of the bag, and this is for poor stomachs really, can be put back into the ground to reinvigorate the soil. Going back to our original premise, to demonstrate how the power of observation can help us reimagine our relationship with the natural world, we used the futures comb. From now, all futures are possible. Without looking at where we're heading though, we tend to move towards the probable and miss out on all of the rest of the alternative futures that lie ahead. Uh, Boros, who designed this cone, uh, suggests there are three laws of futures. Uh, one, that a future is not predetermined. Two, that the future is not predictable. And three, future outcomes can be influenced by our choice in the present. Preferable futures are subject, subjectively what, what we want to happen based on our value judgments, which vary greatly between people. So alternative perspectives are valuable in designing a future that we might all want. <laughs> uh, a lot of people found it really difficult to imagine how we could make this mushroom container farm. Fortunately, we found others in Manchester and, and Yorkshire who were obsessed with mushrooms like us. They'd read the same book. Uh, mycologists, engineers, manufacturers, and DIY mushroom growers. And we exhibited Farm Lab as part of an allotment of the future in Manchester to help Manchester residents imagine what food we might eat in the future with the challenge of coming with climate change. Now it's here in Manchester, and it's taking up the space normally given to a car in a car park next to a pub. And its presence has begun to um, get into people's imagin imaginations, and the pub are planning a community garden with local residents around that container. So we managed to bring organic uh, growing from the countryside into the inner city. How do we apply these, um, these, these ideas to a range of man-made problems? By consciously involving people uh, in the science and design of cities, can we move closer to getting a more sustainable future? So a few years back, we visited Malmo, which has a very similar uh, industrial her heritage to Manchester. And the city council there... Oh! oh. <laughs> duh, duh, duh. You didn't see it. Cats. No, gorillas. <laughs> OK. Um, Anyway, the city council in Malmo decided to involve architects and construction workers in the challenge of creating biogas from food waste. They simply built um, food collection into the design and construction of all new buildings. And the end result was a city that runs 100% on biogas from the food waste collected from people's homes. That's our mushrooms. And finally, what could we learn from our pets that we live with, uh, love and don't want to lose? Uh, in terms of our connection with other species. But that's another story. 
Uh, thanks for listening.